Welcome to Forbidden Planet TV. I'm Andrew Sumner, and today I'm privileged to be joined by author AJ West. How are you, AJ? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. It's a busy day today because uh, I'm doing my first book signing, so uh, I'm hoping I might be able to do one for Forbidden Planet. And actually, I have to say, um, it's uh, quite a big deal for me to be in Forbidden Planet, so thank you very much for having my book Oh, it is our pleasure and we're very excited about the book and I'm sure we'll get some signing figured out. I'm sure that that's a conversation that is going down at the moment because it's a wonderful uh, concept, your novel, The Spirit Engineer. So what can you tell me about it, mate? Yeah, well, when I first started writing, it was just going to be called The Engineer, but I thought people might think it's just about tractors. So I thought, <laughs> and then it was The Ghost Engineer. I thought no one, um, no one in spiritualist circles in Edwardian times really used the term ghost. It was yeah. spirits and operators. So the book is about um, an Edwardian professor of engineering. It's based on a true story. And his name was William Jackson Crawford. And he investigated um, a, a circle of mediums who are called the Golliger Circle. And there was one particular uh, spiritual medium called Kathleen Golliger, who was 16 at the time. This was in 1914 when he started investigating her. And basically together they became world famous, not just in spiritualist circles, but beyond that, because Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who people will know, obviously wrote the Sherlock Holmes books, course, but he was yeah. also... He was, he, was the, he was the king, really, of, of the spiritualist movement at that time, was a great believer. And so, yes, they rose to worldwide fame. Uh, and he investigated Kathleen for a period of six years. And then uh, at the end of those six years, having published uh, three books, his uh, body was found on the rocks, picky rocks in Bangor in Northern Ireland in strange circumstances. He had taken his own life with potassium cyanide. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle said that he had done so because it was his last greatest experiment. Um, Harry Houdini, who people might also know, were, devoted much of his later career into debunking spiritual mediums. He said, no, he, he discovered after six years that he had been made a fool of and that it was all false. And so my book is telling that story. It's based on a true story. But it's very much my dramatization of it. And, and, and AJ, how did you how did you come to be uh, associated? How, did you, were, how were you exposed to this story in the first place? exposed is yeah it's, it's a good way of putting it actually because it's taken over the last four years of my <laughs> life I, I was um I, I read uh, I watched uh, an HBO series with Adrian Brody playing Harry Houdini and I, I was I remember that a brilliant series actually yeah. and that covered a little bit of his spiritualist investigation and um, as we do these days I got straight on my phone and was googling around it and found that Houdini had a book called A Magician Among the Spirits which is still available as a reprint online and I ordered it and was reading through the book now at the time I was a BBC TV reporter and, and, and newsreader uh, in Belfast in Northern Ireland yeah. and so I got near the end of the book and out of nowhere, he just mentions in, in passing, really, oh, there was this Professor Jackson Crawford in Belfast. He killed himself. I met him. I thought he was mad. He more or less invented ectoplasm, um, to use my own uh, phraseology. And I almost dropped the book. I just couldn't believe it because no, no one, you know, there's, I, I'd, I'd done stories in Northern Ireland about some of the uh, socio-political history, but no one really had spoken about the spiritualist history in Belfast and in Northern Ireland. And it just knocked me for six. And as soon as I read it, I thought, well, this story must have been told a hundred times. But the more I looked, it, it kind of hadn't been told, really. And um, I'd always been looking for the story that I had to write for my first novel yeah. and I just knew in that moment that I'd found it yeah well, well and it's, it is a, a, a tremendously tremendously powerful story um I find it very interesting that all of this spiritualist activity should be taking place in Belfast which is so strongly identified identified with orthodox religion so so do you think the two things go hand in hand you know the kind of the, the 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 fascination with spiritualism and the fact that there is also a tremendous amount of religious belief in the area or is 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 that not really the case what's your view yeah it's a really interesting question it's something that i touch on in the book 
Um, so the uh, the lead character, William Jackson Crawford, and his family were Protestant. I did find in my research that their maid was Catholic. This is at a time when the home rule debate was still kind of very much ongoing. I mean, I, I won't get too much into the politics there, but due to different um, political machinations, it kind of was happening and it wasn't happening. Um, and so uh, religion was also very much a part of that. But, but um, Catholics in Northern Ireland at the time were suffering a great deal of oppression. Um, and so religion wasn't, as, as, as is the case today, as we're aware, religion wasn't just a cultural thing, it wasn't just a religious thing, it was also a very politicised thing. It actually literally did divide lives. So um, my book takes place a couple of years after the sinking of the Titanic, and the Titanic was built in Belfast at the Holland and Wolfe shipyards, and they'd just introduced their... Um, uh, a rule that you couldn't be a shipyard worker and be Catholic. They more or less kicked the Catholics out. And so there was this huge separation. This, this you know, society was riven down a, a religious divide. So absolutely, it's part of that. And um, the Golagas uh, were uh, also uh, Protestant, but they were working class. And so you have, you have together this kind of melting pot of, yes, religion and, and also politics. And then as far as... Um, uh, the uh, the religious question around spiritualism goes yes it was born into a culture that was was very much about a belief in the afterlife but it would have been very very controversial actually for any of the traditional small c conservative religions if you were dabbling in spiritualism so um but but at that time i think for the whole of uh the empire uh, really if i can put it that way um, spiritualism just had this moment of explosion and I came to it a lot of people will say and this was my understanding well it must be because of the Spanish flu and the first world war and because of you know uh, huge numbers of deaths and mortalities and people wanted to try and make sense of that and I think there's I think that's partly the case but actually if we think about it you know death was a huge part of life for hundreds of years before so why was spiritualism big then I argue it's because at that point, society was becoming less tied to traditional religion and more and more fascinated with science and invention. And if you think about it, spiritualism is about exploration of a new science as much as it is about belief in the afterlife. I think I think that's very I think that's a very interesting point. And of course, what you have in that same era is, is the birth of international communication it, it, it originally at a much more glacial place fueled by by liners by by you know sea travel and whatnot but but the movement of people really begins in that era as well so you, you've got science you have movement of people you've got communication that makes that i've never thought about that before but i think that's a very well made point you've obviously spent a large amount of time thinking about all of this which is yeah. is how you end up writing a book about it I have. And, you know, one thing that occurred to me, and this might be just me, you know, overthinking things, but uh, we're coming off the age as well during Victorian times, the age of the explorer, the, the, you know, the, the explorers of the Antarctic, the people, yeah. climbing, you know, climbing up uh, um, uh, Mount Everest and discovering new uh, lands in the middle of jungles and then uh, and, and, you know, sailing across the oceans and discovering you actually at this point is one of the first moments, I think, when um explorers realize that there might not be very much left to explore and i think arthur conan doyle was one of the world's greatest explorers and i think he was one of the men who came up against that barrier and it, i find it fascinating that he doesn't call the afterlife the afterlife he calls it summer land and it's almost That's like interesting. it's almost like he's wanting to be the first person to plant a flag in a new continent only the yeah. continent is beyond the veil rather than yeah. on this planet so so interesting so interesting i find it I, I find it fascinating um that period of time in conan Doyle's life given the fact that he had been such an empiricist for such a such well, maybe that's part of it but it's it's the fact that he, he had such an empirical take on things and yet he became fascinated with things which were amorphous and i guess he was in on a mission to to prove those things and render some kind of understanding to them yeah, he, he believed, I think, in um, reaching the, the unknown and exploring the unknown. And, uh, you know, he was, he was kind of ridiculed, not, not least actually by Harry Houdini, in fact, yeah. for, for his beliefs. 
but he was um, an extraordinary, a wildly intelligent man. And he just didn't see boundaries, I don't think, in the way that most people did. And so it seemed completely natural to him that it's only right, of course, we should explore what happens after death. Why on earth shouldn't we? And isn't science um, allowing us to explore all sorts of things that we haven't been able to before? We can fly now, we can see further into space. We're starting to discover what the makeup of the world is, what the makeup of our bodies are in a way that we never have yeah. before electricity you know all of these things that we didn't understand before we're now coming to understand why shouldn't death be one of those things yeah well very 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 interesting now i don't want to spoil the narrative of your novel but in your exploration and your time spent with this amazing story did you come did you get to a point where you have a firm view as to what the circumstances of crawford's death actually were I have uh, vacillated on that point many times. I mean, I personally, I, I don't believe in ghosts, but I would love to see one. Yeah. Um, I was in the London Library the other day, actually, and I, was, I got completely lost. And I know people watching this roll their eyes and think I'm just making this up for PR. I can genuinely tell on, on my life, it, it's not the case. I got completely lost in the London Library. If anyone's been, it's this rambling, kind of almost Hogwartsian place. And uh, right up in the, the roof, um, I uh, stumbled across William Jackson Crawford's books out of nowhere. I just turned a corner and they were there in front of me. And there have been so many moments where I've thought, there's just, it's just such a weird coincidence that I've come across this story and that so many different things have come together for me to be able to write it. Look, I, I, I personally would be more Houdini than Conan Doyle. I, I personally believe that he realised he'd been fooled and that that caused him too much mental strain he was a mentally unwell man and he admits that in his last known letter where he says i've been suffering very bad with my badly with my mental health I, i've not been able to sleep i've had terrible headaches but he does specifically say it's not my experiments my work yeah. still stands now you can say you know either you take that as red or you think the lady doth protest too much um but uh, no, I, I personally believe he found out he'd been tricked because, you know, after he uh, after he died, um, his uh, literary executors appointed uh, a spiritualist investigator called Fournier, who had just come back from France, who had been investigating another spiritualist medium called Ava C. And she was really one of the first exponents of um, ectoplasm so she'd have people's faces and things coming out of her mouths yeah. and ver various other orifices and now he had decided that she was a, a real spiritual medium like completely beyond doubt he came back and he uh, he investigated Kathleen Golliger after William's death and after about six weeks of investigation writes in his report that he caught her lifting a stool with her foot and said that it was you know incredible really that that um that William Jackson Crawford had such credulity. So I, I think he realized he'd published these books and uh, built his castle on sand. But I know that there are many people around the world now who would very, very strongly argue against that. And I, I hope they're right, because I would yeah. love to believe that ghosts are real. Oh yeah, well, well said, absolutely right. Now, now on that note, on the wishing that ghosts are real, loving to believe that ghosts are real note, I know that uh, one of the authors uh, that, that you admire is M.R. James, right? Yeah. And uh, we are about to enter, of course, on the run up to Christmas, we're about to enter the the uh, MR James period of the year. So so do you have any do you have any particular uh, ghost tales other than other than this fascinating story of the spirit world that you're involved with that you would recommend for people on the run up to Christmas? Well, my favourite MR James story is Oh Whistle and I'll Come to You, My Lad, which is, I mean, an obvious one. Um, but Great choice, though. It's just brilliant, I think, and, and that did inspire me in the character of William Jackson Crawford as I wrote him, which is a, an academic man who's uh, doubtful and who is hard, to, you know, hard to bring into a world of believing in, in you know, the paranormal, who, who is uh, confounded by what he experiences and that has a, a huge impact on, on his life. I would say that's definitely one I would. I, I also want to um, uh, suggest that people listen to Mark Gatiss reading E.F. Benson's ghost stories. Yeah. Um, you may know E.F. Benson as Map and Lucia, which is a brilliant yeah. wiki camp. Wonderful. Yeah. 
amazing. But he wrote beautiful ghost stories that are very wry and have the same kind of characterizations. There's a kind of campness to it, but the writing is just absolutely beautiful. And they're, they're really creepy, well thought out stories and observations on what it means to be alive. And, and I will say, um, uh, a big inspiration for me in a contemporary sense was Sarah Waters' affinity, um, because that carries such an absolute whacking twist near the end. And I remember reading that a few years ago and thinking, if I can ever give a reader that level of shock and twist, then I'll know I've done a good job. The, AJ, these are these are wonderful recommendations. Mark Gates is an old friend of Forbidden Planet, as you probably know, and he's a uh, he. I I think uh, I'm I'm re I'm super familiar with those stories that you mentioned, and of course, as a narrator, he's just so brilliantly suited to that material. Oh, look, I mean, no no shade at all to Dick and Farmer, who's read the yeah. audio book for The Spirit Engineer. He's done a wonderful job. But I I you know if I ever had the opportunity for Mark Gatiss to bring his talent and sensibility and his sense of the dramatic and that voice to to anything I ever wrote I would be absolutely absolutely blown away his favorite I, I think I'm right in saying Mark's favorite line in any gothic fiction is from uh Dickens's A Christmas Carol and it's just the word much <laughs> and he's one of those guys isn't he Mark who yeah, actually say the word just the word much and it would just yeah. carry so much Oh, for sure. Now he, 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 he's brilliant with that stuff. Well, AJ, we've been talking about your wonderful debut novel, Spirit Engineer, um, published by the venerable Duckworth books. And yeah, let's have a little look at it because it's got the most beautiful cover. Yes, it's got, well, it's, lo it's got some gorgeous foiling. Right, it's lovely. You must be so pleased with that, mate. Yeah, I am, because you know what, getting these book covers, I didn't realise what a science is, actually, and they've done a brilliant, brilliant job. I've got to say my good friend, uh, Andy Goff, as well, has has done these, I don't know if you can oh, see them. And papers, so wonderful. Yeah, lovely. Beautiful illustrations that run all the way through. And in fact, there's one of Houdini and Colin Doyle, which I just think is masterful. It's a, it, as an engraving. Can you see? I can see, and he has nailed both of them. That's lovely. Yeah, he's done a really, really beautiful job. But yes, it's a gorgeous book. Um, I look about 23 in the picture of myself, at the end, <laughs> uh, which obviously I like, airbrushed with an inch of my life. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's, you know, the amazing thing actually as a debut novelist is really just to hold this object in your hand and, of course. and know that other people are going to do the same. It's just, I don't know, I find it so strange. And uh, mate, other people will do the same. I, and, and once again, I've been talking to AJ about his novel, The Spirit Engineer, which you can order from the links attached to this conversation. Um, AJ, thanks so much for joining me. And when we get to the other side of this extended pandemic and this extended altered state that we're all living in, you've got to come into the store and do a reading for us, mate. That'd be awesome. Oh, that would be a dream come true. I'd really like to do that. And everyone watching, if you want to come and uh, connect with me at AJ, uh, AJ West author, I am on all of the social uh, media platforms. But yeah, no, I'd love to come and see you all, um, as you say, when things are settled. Fantastic. You take care of yourself, AJ. Congratulations on the book. I know it's going to do extremely well for you. And thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much. Bye bye. If you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators, subscribe right here. See you soon.